Hey guys, um, sorry that I had to cancel last minute on Monday. I was not feeling well, but today I feel a lot better. So for this Zoom lecture, um, it's going to be on the rest of cardiac. And then on next week's lecture, um, it'll be on blood pressure, but we will do the worksheet that we were supposed to do on the Monday that I canceled. So hopefully it'll go by fairly quickly and um, you guys are just going to be responsible for watching this video. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Let me hit screen share. Disregard this. Um, I'm going to turn off my video. So we're going to start on the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is what regulates involuntary physiologic processes. Um, this includes the heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, um, digestion, and sexual arousal, to name a few. Um, it has two divisions, um, the first one being sympathetic, which is activated during your fight or flight response. The second one being the parasympathetic, which is um, activated during your rest and digest uh, activities. So at first, the heart rate is controlled by your SA node, but then as you get older, at some point, the autonomic nervous system takes over and it causes the heart to either speed up or slow down. And this all depends on these receptors that are located um, near the heart and a little bit upwards from the heart. So you have your carotid sinus uh, baroreceptor, and then you also have your aortic arch baroreceptors. So what are some areas in the brain that control these autonomic functions? Well, the main area that controls these um, functions is the medulla oblongata. Um, it's located here, right on the stem of the brain. Um, it is a center that controls, again, the heart rate, the blood pressure, respiration, uh, vasomotor center. It controls the vasoconstriction and vasodilation of the art arterioles. So there's some major neural pathways um, that control this cardiovascular function. So again, we're on our medulla oblongata, so that part of the brain, and we're connected um, to either the spinal cord or our heart. This real quick. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so you connect either to the heart or to your spinal cord, and then you're able to uh, either increase or decrease your heart rate. So how does this information trigger our medulla oblongata? Um, well, obviously, um, it depends on your thoughts, your sensory stimuli, or any type of emotion that you have. So for example, if I were to tell you guys that you guys have an exam next week, most likely is your fight or flight response would get triggered. And therefore, this would cause your heart rate to increase. So this is how the brain is able to communicate with the heart. It's based on all these thoughts and emotions that are coming into play. So there are some neurotransmitters um, on the autonomic nervous system. These neurons are called preganglionic neurons, and they are found in both the parasympathetic and sympathetic. Again, parasympathetic division is when you are in that rest and digest activity, and sympathetic is when your fight or flight has been activated. So these preganglionic neurons uh, release acetylcholine, and then the parasympathetic postganglionic neurons also released acetylcholine, and then sympathetic postganglionic neurons release neuroepinephrine. So moving on again to the parasympathetic division. The parasympathetic division, like I mentioned before, predominates in that rest and digest condition. So you have 
a preganglionic neuron. So this is what it looks like. It comes from the central nervous system. And again, it releases that acetylcholine. The acetylcholine then binds to this nicotinic receptor on a postganglionic neuron, which also releases acetylcholine. And then this acetylcholine binds to a muscarinic receptor on the heart. Hopefully this is all making sense. Um, if not, here is a table that lets you know um, the chemical that gets secreted from the preganglionic neuron. Again, it's acetylcholine going up, acetylcholine, as we can see here. And then you have the receptor on the postsynaptic neuron. Um, it's called the nicotinic receptor. This is where the acetylcholine binds. And then the chemical that gets secreted from the postganglionic uh, neuron is also acetylcholine. And then what receptor it binds to, it's the muscarinic receptor. And then what effect it has on that target cell, in this case, what effect does it have on the heart? Well, it decreases the heart rate and it decreases the force of contractility in the atria, but only in the atria. And then how is this done or how is this achieved? Um, this is achieved through the potassium efflux. There's an increase. And then there's a decrease in sodium influx as well as um, a decrease in the calcium that comes into the uh, membrane. So now moving on to the sympathetic division. Again, the sympathetic division is when you are in that fight or flight response. So you have this preganglionic neuron from your central nervous system. It releases acetylcholine. The acetylcholine binds to a nicotinic receptor on a postganglionic neuron. The postganglionic neuron releases neuroepinephrine, and it can bind to a beta-1 receptor that is located on your heart. And now there's another uh, preganglionic neuron from the central nervous system that also release, releases um, acetylcholine, but it binds onto the adrenal gland. And then I will show this to you guys as well on the next slide. Um, it binds to the adrenal gland, or I'm sorry, a nicotinic receptor on the adrenal gland, and then it's located on these uh, chromaphrin cells. The chromaphrin cell then secretes 80% of this epinephrine and 20% neuroepinephrine. And then it's also important to note that there's um, alpha-1 and alpha-2 uh, receptors um, the alpha-1 will cause the blood vessels to vasoconstrict. So remember how I mentioned before, um, if you have a hose and the hose is constricting, then the blood flow is being restricted versus if it vasodilates, you kind of expand that uh, hose in its diameter and therefore more uh, flow of the fluid is able to get through. So again, you have your um, kidney and then you have your adrenal gland. And this is where the adrenal medulla is located. So you have your spinal cord and you have your preganglionic sympathetic neuron and they connect to that adrenal medulla region on the adrenal gland. It releases acetylcholine and it binds to this uh, chromaphrin cell which is basically just a modified uh, postganglionic uh, neuron. And then this neuron releases epinephrine into our bloodstream, and then it's able to go to various parts in our body. And these hormones that are secreted are called catecholamines. And again, like I mentioned before, 80% is epinephrine, 20 is neuroepinephrine, and then there's a small, less than 1% of dopamine that gets secreted into our bloodstream. So again, here's another table that shows you guys um, the effects that it has on the heart rate as well as the force of contractility. Um, during the, the sympathetic activity, it lets you know what the preganglionic neuron releases what it binds to on the postsynaptic neuron, and then what that postganglionic uh, neuron releases as well, and the receptor that it binds to, and then its effect it has on the heart. So in this case, during the sympathetic activity, this increases our heart rate. 
and it increases the force of how much our heart is beating. And this is done in the atria as well as the ventricles, therefore increasing the stroke volume. And then on your adrenal gland, again, it lets you know the chemical that gets secreted on the preganglionic uh, neuron, what receptor it binds to, and then the chemical that this um, post ganglionic neuron secretes. But in this case, this post ganglionic neuron is a modified version and it's called a chromaphrine cell. And this chromaphrine cell secretes 80% epinephrine and 20% neuroepinephrine. And then the receptor that it binds to um, is called the beta-1 receptor as well. And then the effect that it has, it also increases the heart rate and the force of contractility. So how is this done? Well, this is done because there is a decrease in the potassium that gets um, effluxed, as well as an increase in the sodium coming in and the calcium that also comes in. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the action potentials of the cardiac cells. So hopefully you guys remember from your experiment when you guys were doing the cardiac, um, this is what an action potential looks like with every heartbeat. So you have an action potential here shown and then you have another action potential here that is shown. There's a small region in between both of these action potentials and it, it is called slow depolarization or pacemaker potential. It's basically um, when the membrane slowly depolarizes or drifts between the action potentials um, until that threshold is reached, which is this green dotted line here. So there is a depolarization period, a rapid depolarization period, and this is when the calcium is coming in. And then you have a repolarization period, and this is when potassium is coming out. And then you have regions, again, within the membrane. They're known as funny channels, um, transient type calcium channels, and then this long lasting calcium channels. And we will go through this as well. So this table here lets you know what ions move into and out of these cells and what effects um, it has on these action potentials. So again, during the pacemaker potential of um, spontaneous depolarization to the subthreshold, it's when these funny channels open, sodium moves in, and then potassium moves out. So what does this look like on an action potential? So I can go up here. It's this region right here. And then you have the spontaneous depolarization threshold. And that's when the T-type channels open and then calcium moves in. So what region is that? It's still here and it's shown here as well. And you have that rapid depolarization phase of this action potential. And that's when these L-type calcium channels open as well. And then calcium moves in. So as you move down that table, you're basically moving from the start of the action potential into the end of the action potential. So if you guys uh, would like to copy this um, table onto your study guides, feel free to do so. So what effects um, change the action potentials depending on sympathetic and parasympathetic activity? Well, this is what a normal heart beat looks like um, and the action potential it creates. So as we can see, there are fairly spaced equally apart. You have that pacemaker potential um, equal on every other action potential. You have that rapid depolarization and then repolarization. And then from one R peak to another R peak, that's one heartbeat. But 
If there is increased sympathetic activity, again, increased fight or flight activity, it causes your heart rate to, to speed up, basically. So what does it have on these action potentials? The action potentials will actually be much closer together. Can you guys see that? The R to R peaks are much closer together. And then what happens if there is an increased in parasympathetic activity, again, in that rest or digest activity? Well, the action potentials will be much farther apart. So now this is a graph that shows you guys the action potential of a contractile cell. You guys have this um, resting membrane potential, and then there's a depolarization period, and then a plateau phase, and then repolarization, and then we come back down again to a resting membrane potential. So what does the contractile response look like? During depolarization, the muscle contracts, and that's this region going upwards during our contraction. And then our contractile cell is then able to relax. So that's when repolarization occurs and it causes the muscle to relax. So again, this table here lets you know um, what ions, what ion channels open up or the response, and then the ions that either move in or out. So for example, when there is zero depolarization, that's this region uh, down here on this action potential. This means that our sodium's channels are open and then sodium is able to come in. And now there's also a small repolarization period. It's not really shown on the graph above, um, but again, when that small repolarization period occurs, the sodium channels um, become inactive. So basically they just um, close and there's very little sodium movement that comes into the memory. You then have this plateau phase, um, which is this region here on the action potential. And so what type of ion channels are opening? Um, the potassium channels are actually closing, but the calcium L-type channels are the ones that are opening. So potassium um, decreases in its movement outwards, and then calcium actually comes in. And then finally, you have repolarization, and then your resting potential, um, again, is where we started at. So repolarization, the potassium is delayed, and then the calcium L-type channels also close. So what does the ion movement look like? The potassium moves out, and then the calcium also um, decreases in its movement inwards. And then we are back again to our resting potential. So we went from the plateau phase down into this uh, region of repolarization, and then finally back to our resting potential. So now moving on to heart rate and arrhythmia. So when you're born, you actually have a heartbeat of above 100 beats per minute. Um, and I was actually gonna ask you guys if any of you guys knew why, and hopefully you guys would have an idea, but it's basically basically because when you're a small uh, kid, you your heart rate increases so that the organism or the person can basically uh, stay alive. And then later on, the autonomic system is what comes into play. So the SA node is what actually is responsible for that increase in the heart rate. So as you get older, your heart rate when you're at rest should be between 60 to 100 beats per minute. And then this is regulated by the medulla oblongata, again, um, in that autonomic nervous system uh, activity. So the medulla oblongata, like I mentioned before, it's the, it's the cardiovascular center. It's responsible for the respiratory center and the vasomotor center. Um, it triggers that autonomic nervous system. 
And then, you know, how I mentioned before, that um, nervous system contains the sympathetic fight or flight and then parasympathetic rest and digest divisions. Um, when you have sympathetic increase, this causes the heart rate to also go up and the force of contractility of the heart to also increase. Fight or flight, parasympathetic, I mean, not parasympathetic, sympathetic. Sorry about that. Um, then you have the parasympathetic, which is that rest and digest. It decreases the heart rate and the force of contractility in your atria. So when there's abnormalities in your heart rate, this is either called tachycardia or bradycardia, depending on how many beats per minute. So an arrhythmia is basically an irregular heartbeat when you are at rest, when you're not doing any strenuous activities. So tachycardia describes a heart rate that is greater than 100 beats per minute when you are at rest. And bradycardia describes a heartbeat that is slower than 60 beats per minute, again, when you are at rest. So for example, if you're doing exercise and you're out going out for a run, your heart technically at times tends to go above 100 beats per minute. But the reason is because you're going and putting it through um, a strenuous activity. You're in motion, you're moving. Of course, your heart rate is going to increase. But if you're at rest and you're not really doing this hard labor or putting your heart through that um, activity, and it is above 100 beats per minute, that's when it starts to become something that's worrisome. And that's when um, we know that it can be tachycardia. So again, this is what the action potentials of a normal heart rate look like. They are fairly evenly spaced. But if it's um, tachycardia, your heart rate increases. Therefore, your action potentials become much closer. Um, and then there's also different abnormalities in the rhythms. So for example, this dip here is due to a premature ventricular contraction. And then there's also these smaller frequencies. This is called ventricular fibrillation. And then during complete heart block, this is um, what the action potential would look like. And then you have the uh, cardiac myo myopathies. Um, and this is basically when you're going through a heart attack, this is the type of action potential you would see. So during respiratory sinus arrhythmia, this is basically when you're either inhaling or exhaling. So during deep inspiration or a deep inhale, when you breathe in, you, you increase that sympathetic activity and you increase your heart rate. So if you guys were to try this out and take a deep breath in, you notice that your heart rate actually increases. And then when you take a deep breath out, this causes um, in, an increase in parasympathetic activity and it actually causes your heart rate to slow down. So now we're gonna move on to the electrocardiogram or ECG and EKG. They are both the same thing. So the sum of electrical activity um, throughout the heart is known as the electrocardiogram. Again, electrical activity, we describe that as our action potential. There are waves in these action potentials and they represent depolarization and repolarization of the atria and the ventricles in our heart. So remember, depolarization results in a contraction and repolarization is when the cardiac muscle relaxes. So if you guys remember on your experiment, how you guys placed these um, electrodes on your body, this is called the Eintoven's triangle. So you place the lead one from the left arm to the right arm. The left arm contains the positive electrode and the right arm contains the negative electrode. Then you have this lead two going from your right arm to your left leg. Again, the right arm contains a negative electrode and the left leg contains a positive electrode. 
And then finally, you have your lead three. Um, the left leg is positive, and again, the left arm is negative. And this is how an ECG is recorded. So again, this is just another way of viewing it in case the previous image um, didn't make quite much sense. Um, again, it's Ian Tobin's triangle. It consists of uh, positive electrodes and negative electrodes. Um, so again, lead one is from the right arm and the left arm, and lead two is from the right arm and the left leg, and lead three is from the left arm and the left leg. And then you have your ground electrode as well, which is on the right leg. So this is what a standard um, ECG looks like. We have what is known as a P wave, which is produced by this atrial depolarization or that muscle contraction in the heart. And then you have a QRS complex. It's this region here, QRS, and this is due to ventricular depolarization. Again, that ventricular um, contraction. And then you have in a region called the T wave. It's this little lump right here. And it is due to ventricular repolarization or um, ventricular muscle relaxation. You have what is known as a PR segment. It's located from the end of the P up until the start of the R. And this is due to the AV nodal delay. And then you have a PR interval as well. And it is due to atrial depolarization um, as well as the conduction through that AV node. And then you have our ST segment. We can see it here in purple. And this is due to the ventricular systole. And then you have your QT interval. And this is due to ventricular depolarization and repolarization. This um, image here is actually going to come back into play in our worksheet. So if you guys want to just take another look at it again, um, review before class on Monday, feel free to do so. So again, here's just another image that shows you guys the various different regions and how to view it on a uh, ECG recording. So again, same thing. If this is just more information for you guys, that lets you know the amplitude and then how long each region lasts on an action potential. And then now we have these, um, or this flow chart, and it lets you know um, what occurs in the heart and how that is actually um, being recorded on an ECG. So we start at the SA node, remember? And this is recorded as a P wave. And this is atrial depolarization. And then we move on to the atria. And then that's when our PQ or PR segment comes into play. Again, that AV node and um, the AV bundle is being activated. And then now we are at our Q wave. We are at the um, bundle of his, the left and right. And then we have our QR, and that's the movement into the perjunky fibers, and so on and so forth. And again, this is just another uh, image for you guys. Um, so as well, you have atrial excitation. It begins on the SA node and it is completed once it reaches that AV node. And then you have ventricular excitation, which begins um, due to atrial relaxation. And then it is completed um, once the relaxation has taken place. And then you have that ventricular relaxation as well down here. And then you have your full action potential. So there's other different effects um, on myocardial ischemia or injury. 
um, and what it has on this ECG. So for example, if there is a lack of blood flow, um, this is what it looks like. And then you have this inverted uh, tiny T wave here. So basically um, myocardial is ischemia causes the ST segment um, with or without the T wave inversion and it results in an altered repolarization period. And then if it's a myocardial injury, this causes the ST segment to elevate. Can you guys see that here? And then if it's a myocardial infraction, this causes a deep Q wave and results in the absence of this um, depolarization current. This can actually lead to a heart attack. So can you guys see that there's a deep Q here? And then you have, again, your T uh, region as well. So um, you guys were able to conduct your ECG experiment, um, your group assignment eight. Um, so I don't really have to go through this setup. So for Monday, we are gonna be working on the worksheet. It's not long, it's only two pages. Um, and then we're gonna be doing blood pressure. And we will be also conducting the experiment for blood pressure. So let me stop sharing. So again, feel free to review the notes, review the slides. If you guys have any questions, feel free to email me. I will try to get back to you as soon as possible. The updated grades have been uploaded on that Excel sheet. You can find it on Canvas under the administration tab. Um, and yeah, have a great rest of the week. I will see you guys on Monday. Bye.